Um, I, I would like to, on behalf of the Dickinson Society and the EDIS board, also um, dedicate this portion of the session to the memory of Judith Farr. Um, as many of you know, Judith unfortunately passed away recently. Um, and, and also send uh, well wishes to two of our members, Alex Socrides and Ellen Hart. Alex, some of you may know, experienced a, a rather bad fall recently and she's recuperating. And Ellen Hart is also re uh, going to be recuperating soon from, um, from hip surgery. So we wish them, we wish them all well. Thank you and, for doing that, Elizabeth. Welcome. Take it away, Brooke. Take it away, Parik. <laughs> okay. Um, so welcome to this reading of selections from Dickinson's writings alongside her favorite passages from Shakespeare. So this afternoon's readers are Tom Daly, a playwright and poet from Boston, who's the author of a Dickinson theme play, Every Broom and Bridget, and whose poetry has appeared in the Harvard Review, Massachusetts Review, Fence, and the Denver Quarterly. Barbara Dana, a playwright and actor who has played the part of Dickinson in The Bell of Amherst, most recently when the play toured the US and Canada. Dana is the author of A Voice of Her Own Becoming, Emily Dickinson, and she co-edited Wider Than the Sky, Essays and Meditations on the Healing Power of Emily Dickinson with our next reader, Cindy McKenzie. Cindy McKenzie is Professor Emerita at the University of Regina in Canada. She's the author of A Concordance to the Letters of Emily Dickinson and co-editor with Jane Eberwine of Reading Dickinson's Letters, Critical Essays. Brooke Steenhauser, is program director at the Emily Dickinson Museum, where she first fell in love with historic house museums when she worked there as a student tour guide. In addition to her passion for museum work, Brooke is a classically trained actor and singer who performs with local community theatres, including the Hampshire Shakespeare Company. So my name, if you don't know it already, is Porrick Finnerty, and I'm a reader in English and American studies at the University of Portsmouth and the author of Emily Dickinson's Shakespeare and the co-author of Victorian Celebrity Culture and Tennyson Circle. And I will introduce this afternoon's readings. So during and after Dickinson's period of eye trouble from 1864 to 1865, she told various correspondents that Shakespeare was the first author she chose to read. She also told them that for her, Shakespeare was the only necessary author. After his 1870 interview with the poet, Thomas Wentworth Higginson made the following note. After long disuse of her eyes, she read Shakespeare and thought, why is any other book needed? Her letters abound with her great love of Shakespeare. She told Elizabeth Holland, Stratford on Avon accept us all. She told Franklin B. Sanborn, he has had his future who has found Shakespeare. After reading Helen Hunt Jackson's novel, Ramona, Dickinson told Jackson, pity me, however, I have finished Ramona, would that like Shakespeare, it were just published. Her niece, Martha Dickinson Bianchi recalls, for Dickinson, it was Shakespeare, always and forever. Othello, her chosen villain, with Macbeth familiar as the neighbours, and Lear driven into exile as vivid as if occurring on the hills before her door. Despite her reverence for Shakespeare, in her writings, she modifies, fragments, and transforms his words. She adapts phrases and lines from his plays to suit her purposes, and even puts his thoughts into her words. This afternoon's readings will begin with the passages from Shakespeare Dickinson turned to in March 1865, during the period between her two visits to Boston for eye treatment. Dickinson told Louise Norcross that she read passages from Shakespeare in the garret. Dickinson reads John Talbot's parting with his son from Act Four of Henry VI, Part One. This play is an unusual choice 
as it was then and remains one of Shakespeare's least popular plays. The scene Dickinson read presents the dauntless John Talbot bidding a final farewell to his dead son before dying himself. I read a few words since I came home, John Talbot's parting with his son and Margaret's with Suffolk. I read them in the garret and the rafters wept. Thou antic death, which laughed us here to scorn, anon from thy insulting tyranny coupled in bonds of perpetuity, two Talbots winged through the lither sky, in thy despite shall scape mortality. O oh, thou whose wounds become hard favored death, Speak to thy father, ere thou yield thy breath. Brave death by speaking, whether he will or no, imagine him a Frenchman and thy foe. Poor boy, he smiles, methinks, as who should say, had death been French, then death had died today. Come, come and lay him in his father's arms. My spirit can no longer bear these harms. Soldiers, adieu. I have what I would have. Now my old arms are young John Talbot's grave. The other speech Dickinson read in the garret was Queen Margaret's parting with her lover Suffolk from Act Three of Henry VI, Part Two. Again, this was not a popular play, and Queen Margaret is generally regarded as one of Shakespeare's most ruthless characters. Margaret dominates others, including her weak husband, Henry VI. Although she will do anything to maintain power, she is devastated when Suffolk is banished for his part in the murder of the Duke of Gloucester. Oh, let me entreat thee cease. Give me thy hand that I may do it with my mournful tears, nor let the rain of heaven wet this place to wash away my woeful monuments. Oh, could this kiss be printed in thy hand that thou might think upon these by the seal through whom a thousand sighs are breathed for thee. So get thee gone that I may know my grief. Tis but surmised whilst thou art standing by as one that surfeits thinking on a want. I will repeal thee, or be well assured adventure to be banished myself, and banished I am if but from thee. Go speak not to me, even now be gone. Oh, go not yet, even thus two friends condemned, embrace and kiss and take 10,000 leaves, loather a hundred times to part than die. Yet now farewell, and farewell life with thee. The first literary work Dickinson read after her period of eye trouble ended was Antony and Cleopatra. In a letter to her cousin, Joseph Lyman, she describes her passionate, even violent, first contact with Shakespeare and displays luscious pages. Well do I remember the music of the welcome home. <clears throat> it was at his office. He whistled up the fox hounds. He clapped and said, Sesame, oh, how my blood bounded. Shakespeare was the first. Anthony and Cleopatra were in a barbarous laments the amorous lapse of his master. Here is the ring of it. Heart that in the scuffles of great fights hath burst the buckle on his breast. Then I thought, why touch the clasp, clasp any hand but this? Give me ever to drink of this wine. Going home, I flew to the shelves and devoured the luscious passages. I thought I should tear the leaves out as I turned them. Then I settled down to a willingness for all the rest to go, but William Shakespeare. Why need we, Joseph, read anything else but him? 
Nay, but this dotage of our generals overflows the measure. Those his goodly eyes that o'er the files and musters of the war have glowed like plated Mars, now bend, now turn. The office and devotion of their view upon a tawny front. His captain's heart, which in the scuffles of great fights hath burst the buckles on his breast, renegs all temper, and is become the bellows and the fan to cool a gypsy's lust. Look where they come. Take but note, and you shall see in him the triple pillar of the world transformed into a strumpet's fool. Behold and see. Dickinson was particularly drawn to this play's depiction of Antony's great love for Cleopatra and her power to endlessly fascinate him. Dickinson used one particular line from Act Three to capture Antony's enduring passion and devotion. She sent this line as an 1874 letter to Susan Dickinson and included it in an, an 1885 letter to Mabel Loomis Todd. Egypt, thou knewest. Dear friend, nature forgot. The circus reminded her. Thanks for the Ethiopian face. The Orient is in the West. You knew, O oh Egypt, said the entangled Antony. Oh, whither hast thou led me, Egypt? See how I convey my shame out of thine eyes by looking back what I have left behind, stroyed in dishonor. Oh, my lord, my lord, forgive my fearful sails. I little thought you would have followed. Egypt, thou knewest too well. My heart was to thy rudder tied by the strings, and thou shouldst tow me after or my spirit thy full supremacy thou knewest, and that thy back might from the bidding of the gods command me. Another scene from Antony and Cleopatra Dickinson referenced in her writings was the one where Enobarbus describes Antony's first meeting with Cleopatra, where he first <laughs> became enthralled by her. Again, she summons up this scene using its key line in an 1880s letter to Susan, and an 1885 letter to her nephew, Ned. Will my great sister accept the minutia of devotion with timidity that it is no more? Susan's calls are like Antony's supper and pays his heart for what his eyes eat only. What an embassy, what an ambassador and pays his heart for what his eyes eat only. Excuse the bearded pronoun, ever, Aunt Emily. The barge she sat in like a burnished throne burnt on the water. The poop was beaten gold, purple the sails and so perfumed that the winds were lovesick with them. The oars were silver, which to the tune of flutes kept stroke and made the water which they beat to follow faster, as amorous of their strokes. For her own person it beggared all description. From the barge a strange, invisible perfume hits the sense of the adjacent wharfs. The city cast her people out upon her, and Antony, enthroned in the marketplace, did sit alone, whistling to the air, which but for vacancy had gone to gaze on Cleopatra too and made a gap in nature. Upon her landing, Antony sent to her, invited her to supper. She replied, it should be better he become her guest, which she entreated. Our courteous Antony, whom ne'er the word of no woman heard speak, being barbered ten times o'er, goes to the feast, and for his ordinary, pays his heart for what his eyes eat only.
In her poem, The Tint I Cannot Take is Best, Dickinson alludes to Anna Barbus's descriptions of what it would be like to be in Cleopatra's company, to express the fascination of that which evades our conceptual and linguistic grasp. The tint I cannot take is best. The color too remote that I could show it in bizarre. A guinea at a sight. The fine impalpable array that swaggers on the eye. Like Cleopatra's company repeated in the sky. The moments of dominion that happen on the soul and leave it with a discontent too exquisite to tell. The eager look on landscapes as if they just repressed some secret that was pushing like chariots in the vest. The pleading of the summer, that other prank of snow that cushions mystery with tool for fear the squirrels know. Their graspless manners mock us until the cheated eye shuts arrogantly in the grave. Another way to see. Dickinson also greatly admired Shakespeare's other Roman play, Julius Caesar. In June 1884, she tells Elizabeth Holland that hearing someone read Antony's friend's Roman countryman speech could provide comfort at a time of loneliness. I was with you in all the loneliness when you took your flight, for every jostling of the spirit barbs the loss afresh. Even the coming out of the sun after an hour's rain intensifies their absence. Ask some kind voice to read to you Mark Antony's oration over his playmate Caesar. I never knew a broken heart to break itself so sweet. Come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious and Brutus is an honorable man. He hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. You all did see that on the looper call, I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and sure, he is an honorable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for him? O oh, judgment, thou art fled to brutish beasts, and men have lost their reason. Bear with me. My heart is in the coffin there with Caesar, and I must pause till it come back to me. After Antony and Cleopatra, Dickinson's other favorite play was Othello. Dickinson was particularly drawn to Barbantio's reluctant parting with his daughter Desdemona to Othello and to the Duke of Venice's response to Barbantio. Dickinson references this scene in an 1878 letter to her friend, Maria Whitney, an 1879 letter to Higginson, an 1876 letter to Catherine Sweetser, and an 1884 letter to Helen Hunt Jackson. To relieve the irreparable degrades it. Brabantio's resignation is the only one. 
I here do give thee that with all my heart, which but thou hast already, with all my heart, I would keep from thee. Brabantio's gift was not more fair than yours, though I trust without his pathetic inscription, which but thou hast already, with all my heart, I would keep from thee. Though death is perhaps an intimate friend, not an enemy. Beloved Shakespeare says, he that is robbed and smiles steals something from the thief. He who is slain and smiles steals something from the sword, but you have stolen the sword itself, which is far better. God be with you, I have done. Please it your grace on to the state affairs. I had rather to adopt a child than get it. Come hither more. I here do give thee that with all my heart, which but thou hast already, with all my heart I would keep from thee. For your sake, Jewel, I am glad at soul I have no other child, for thy escape would teach me tyranny, to hang clogs on them. I have done, my lord. Let me speak like yourself and lay a sentence, which as a grease or step may help these lovers. When remedies are past, the griefs are ended by seeing the worst which late on hopes depended. To mourn a mischief that is past and gone is the next way to draw new mischief on. What cannot be preserved when fortune takes, patience her injury a mockery makes. The robbed that smiles steals something from the thief. He robs himself that spends a bootless grief. Dickinson was also drawn to scenes from Shakespeare's other tragedies, Macbeth, Hamlet, and Romeo and Juliet. For Macbeth, Dickinson was especially interested in the scene where Macbeth discusses his wife's health with her doctor. She refers to it in an 1869 letter to her cousin, Perez Cowan, and an 1880 letter to her Norcross cousins, and an 1885 letter to Sue's brother, Thomas Gilbert. It grieves me that you speak of death with so much expectation. The subject hurts me so that I will put it down because it hurts you. We bruise each other less in talking than in writing, for then a quiet accent helps words themselves too hard. Do you remember, Peter, what the physician said to Macbeth? That sort must heal itself. I forget no part of that sweet smarting visit, nor even the nettle that stung my rose. When Macbeth asked the physician what could be done for his wife, he made the mighty answer, that sort must heal itself. But sister, that was guilt. And love, you know, is God, who certainly gave the love to reward the love, even were there no browning. There is little to say, dear Mr. Gilbert, when the heart is bruised. How hallowedly Macbeth said, that sort must heal itself. Yet a grieved whisper from a friend might instruct it how. How does your patient, doctor? Not so sick, my lord, as she is troubled with thick coming fancies that keep her from her rest. Cure her of that. Canst thou not minister to a mind diseased, pluck from the memory a rooted sorrow, raise out the written troubles of the brain, and with some sweet oblivious antidote, cleanse the stuffed bosom of that perilous stuff which weighs upon the heart. Therein the patient must minister to himself. 
From Hamlet, Dickinson was especially drawn to Gertrude's description of Ophelia's watery death. She refers to this in an 1880 letter to Elizabeth Holland, who is nursing her sick husband, and in an 1885 letter to Abby C. Farley, whose cousin Mary Farley had drowned in Walden Pond. I trust the hand has ceased from troubling. It has saved too many to be assailed by an envious sliver. Had we known the doctor was falling, we had been much alarmed. Though grace, perhaps, is the only height from which falling is fatal. What a reception for you. Did she wait for your approbation? Her deferring to die until you came seemed to me so confiding, as if nothing should be presumed. It can probably never be real to you. The veil that helps us fall so mercifully over it. An envious sliver broke was a passage your uncle peculiarly loved in the drowning Ophelia. Was it a premonition to him to whom events and omens are at last the same? There is a willow grows a slant of brook that shows his hoar leaves in the glassy stream. There with fantastic garlands did she come of crow flowers, nettles, daisies, and long purples that liberal shepherds give a grosser name, but our cold maids do dead men's fingers call them. There on the pendant boughs, her coronet weeds clamoring to hang, an envious sliver broke. When down her weedy trophies and herself fell in the weeping brook, her clothes spread wide, and mermaid-like, a while they bore her up, which time she chanted snatches of old tunes as one incapable of her own distress or like a creature native and endued unto that element. But long it could not be till that her garments, heavy with their drink, pulled the poor wretch from her melodious lay to muddy death. Dickinson was fascinated by the scene from Romeo and Juliet, where Romeo purchases poison from an apothecary. She mentions it in a November 1881 letter, thanking her cousin Francis Norcross for a recipe for graham bread. She also uses it in one of her final letters, dated 17th of April, 1886, to her sick aunt, Elizabeth Currier, where she connects local events in Amherst with occurrences in Romeo and Juliet. The bread resulted charmingly and such pretty little proportions, quaint as a druggist's formula. I do remember an apothecary. Mother and Vinnie think it is the nicest they have ever known and Maggie so extols it. I do remember an apothecary said that sweeter Robin than Shakespeare was a lover, loved paragraph which has lain on my pillow all winter. But perhaps Shakespeare has been up street oftener than I have this winter. Would father's youngest sister believe that in the Shire town where he and Blackstone went to school, a man was hung in Northampton yesterday for the murder of a man by the name of Dickinson and that Miss Harriet Merrill was poisoned by a strolling juggler and to be tried in the Supreme Court next week? Don't you think fumication ceased when father died? Poor romantic Miss Merrill. But perhaps a police gazette was better for you than an essay. Well, Juliet, I will lie with thee tonight. Let's see for means. Oh, mischief, thou art swift to enter in the thoughts of desperate men. I do remember an apothecary. And hereabouts he dwells, which late I noted in tattered weeds with overwhelming brows, culling of simples, meager were his looks, sharp misery had worn him to the bones, and his needy shop a tortoise hung, an alligator stuffed, and other skins of ill-shaped fishes. And about his shelves, a beggarly account of empty boxes, green earthen pots, 
bladders and misty seeds, remnants of pack thread and old cakes of roses were thinly scattered to make up a show. Noting this penury to myself, I said, and if a man did need a poison now, who saw a sale is present death in Mantua, here leave, lives a caitiff wretch would sell it him. Oh, this same thought did but forewarn my need, and this same needy man must sell it me. As I remember, this should be the house. Being holiday, the beggar's shop is shut. What? Ho! Apothecary! Dickinson's use of Shakespeare is often very amusing. In an 1884 letter to Elizabeth Holland celebrating the birth of Holland's grandchild, Dickinson rapidly moves in the space of a few lines from Macbeth to As You Like It to Othello and even includes a reference to the most famous Shakespearean actor of the day, Tommaso Salvini. A quotation from Macbeth referring to the death of a traitor becomes a celebration of new life. Then Dickinson jokes that she will lose some of Holland's love and attention to this new grandchild. She will be left with love's remainder biscuit, which according to As You Like It is dry after a voyage, but will bear it as Othello did, presumably without the murderous intent. The contemplation of you as grandma is a touching novelty to which the mind adjusts itself by reverent degrees. That nothing in her life became her like its last event, it is probable. So the little engrosser has done her work and love's remainder biscuit is henceforth for us. We will try to bear it as divinely as Othello did, who had he had love's sweetest slice would not have charmed the world. Austin heard Salvini before his idol died, and the size of that manifestation, even the grave has not foreclosed. One of Dickinson's most ingenious uses of Shakespeare is a reference to the Tempest in her poem, A Root in Evervescence. Dickinson's Mail from Tunis appears to refer to the Tempest and the scene in which Antonio encourages Sebastian to kill his sleeping brother, King Alonso of Naples, so that Sebastian can then crown himself king. As Antonio explains, Alonso's heir, his daughter Clarabel, is far away in Tunis and no message will reach her about their treachery. Ariel, however, sings in Gonzalo's ear and wakens him. Dickinson captures the speed of her hummingbird by comparing it to Ariel, who becomes the male Clarabel sends from Tunis to protect her father. A root of evanescence with a revolving wheel, a resonance of emerald, a rush of cochineal, and every blossom on the bush adjusts its tumbled head. The male from Tunis probably, an easy morning's ride. She that is queen of Tunis, she that dwells 10 leagues beyond man's life, she that from Naples can have no note unless the sun were post, the man in the moon's too slow, till newborn chins be rough and razorable, she from whom we all were sea swallowed, though some cast again, and by that destiny to perform an act whereof what's past is prologue, what to come in yours and my discharge. Ariel sings in Gonzalo's ear. Upon mine honor, sir, I, I heard a humming, and, and that a strange one too, which did awake me. I shaked you, sir, and cried as mine eyes opened. I saw their weapons drawn. There was a noise. That's verily the best we stand upon our guard or that we quit this place. Let, let's draw our weapons. It seems fitting to give the final word to Dickinson. Her poems, dramas, vitalist expression is the common day, reminds us that, that although she loved Shakespeare beyond all other writers, she was also committed to forging her own literary and aesthetic path. 
As she clarifies in this poem, her poetry is concerned with the infinite and internal dramas of everyday life, which for her are more vital than anything in Shakespeare's plays, because they continue long after stage tragedies finish and theatres and playhouses shut. Drama's vitalist expression is the common day that arise and set about us. Other tragedies perish in the recitation. This, the best in act, when the audience is scattered and the boxes shut. Hamlet to himself were Hamlet, had not Shakespeare wrote though the Romeo left no record of his Juliet. It were infinite enacted in the human heart. Only theater recorded it. Owner cannot shut. I think we're all stunned. Maybe we should all unmute and applaud. Let's all unmute and applaud. Great idea. Yay. Great. <laughs> Excellent. That was so fantastic. Does I mean, I'm uh, I feel you know so gratified to have had to have had the opportunity to hear that. Did did anyone want to add anything, Parak? Uh, any any final parting thoughts? Um, all I would just say is the readers were absolutely brilliant, and as I told them when we did a dress rehearsal on Monday. The, the, the lines from Dickinson and the lines from Shakespeare just came together so beautifully. And I've never heard them together in that way because I've always looked at them separately. And I just thought it was absolutely beautiful. So I'm just so um, delighted and honored to have been part of this. But those readers, those four people have done such an amazing job of bringing both Shakespeare's lines alive and, and Dickinson's lines alive and together. Here, here. I, I just want to say, Parag, that it was rather ingenious of you to put all of that together in such a really incredibly beautiful way. And uh, it seemed when I first read it like it was going to be a very long program, but it went by so quickly. It was so engaging. Really brilliant job, Parag. Thank you for your great direction. Yes, Parag, I, I second that. Yeah, really, it was a beautiful program. Thank yeah. you. And, and one that uh, uh, I learned so much from. A as you said, Parak, you, you know, the, the, the way they weave together, it's so illuminating to the, uh, you know, with a, anyway, I, I just, I, I loved being a part of this exercise. I just have to share an observation that I had uh, this time going through this, which is that the way that Shake uh, the way that Dickinson seems to have reference at the fingertip at her fingertips for Shakespeare in her writing, and it seems to just flow so so quickly and so easily for her, is um, the very same thing that amazes our visitors at the Emily Dickinson Museum about our tour guides and their ease of reference to Dickinson's own words, and I just love that resonance. Thanks for letting me be part of this, Parik. Well, I'd love to thank everyone who was involved in this um, and special thanks to Parik, Adeline, Jane Wald for um, really taking the time to put this um, entire session together. We worked together and it was truly, you know, a privilege to be able to do that. Um,